मैडम स्टार्ट कर हेलो एवरीवन गुड मॉर्निंग दिस इज शेख पेनेजर असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंग्लिश बॉर्जरा कॉलेज आई वेलकम यू ऑल Thank you for joining this webinar on interdisciplinarity re reading literary texts organized by the Department of English Borjara College. We have with us our chief guest, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Bankura University, Professor Devnarayan Bandopadhyay, 
our patron dr sheik sirajuddin principal of shaldiha college our chairperson dr arun kumar roy principal of borjora college and our special guest professor shorbojit bishwas controller of examination additional charge bakura university we also we have also with have us our four our eminent four speakers, speakers. Dr. Shormishtha Chatterjee Srivastava of Alia University, Dr. Arnab Kumar Sinha of the University of Burdwan, Mr. Shukhendu Das of Bankura University, and Mr. Ayan Mandol of Bankura Christian College. Thank you for joining. Now I cordially invite our principal, sir, Dr. Arun Kumar Roy. The chairperson, the chairperson to address, to the, address invitee. the invitee. Thank you, sir, Thank for, you joining sir us. for joining us. Over no. to you, sir. Good morning to one and all present here. At first, I would like to thank the Department of English of our college for inviting me to this webinar platform. I express my deepest gratitude to our honorable chief guest, Professor Devnaran Bandopadhyay, the Vice Chancellor, Bakura University, for honoring us with his dignified presence today on this webinar. Thank you so much, sir, for taking out some time from your busy schedule and attend our program. I am sure your presence will make the event more memorable and cherishable. I also welcome Dr. Sheikh Sirajuddin and thank him too for his valuable presence in this webinar. But due to some urgent work, it is not possible for him to attend this webinar. I express my sincere thanks to Professor Sarvajit Vishas for his special address on today's occasion. The topic of today's webinar is interdisciplinarity re reading literary text. And I welcome and congratulate all the participating resource person. My best wishes to all the participants. I hope today's topic of discussion will help the participant in their future endeavors. I hope this webinar will be a grand success with all your sincere efforts and cooperation. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you, sir, for your speech.
Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Hello. Ha, sir. Next so we have the. Ha, sir. Next we have the inaugural address by our chief guest, Professor Devnarayan Bondopadhyay, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Bakura University. Thank you, sir, for joining with us. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity to be involved with this webinar uh, on rereading literary texts. Um, in fact, uh, I must first of all congratulate the principal of this uh, college. I believe I attended one more webinar organized by this college earlier. But however, this is on uh, English literature, and I'm very, very much interested in this. And uh, I saw some of the eminent speakers who will uh, talk about their reflections on the literature, the literary texts in a new context, maybe. Uh, let me tell you that I have been also reading the literary texts in very, very new contexts, especially when you are tied down to a particular room or a house. Uh, you have really no other option but to read the books that you have or go over to the internet and download many, many books that you had imagined earlier to have uh, to be able to read, but you couldn't, you didn't have time. But now is the time that we can very freely, I mean, move up to this task of reading the books that I wish to read earlier. And now is the chance for us to read it. I've been reading King Oedipus, so what is just King Oedipus, for instance. And uh, uh, I know that King Oedipus is a, is a very traditional text and it is being taught in most of the universities. And nowadays, uh, it's also taught at the UG level, although I'm not really very sure if it is at all appropriate to teach King Oedipus at the UG level without having a background in Aristotle's poetics. However, I'm not going into those uh, controversies, but I feel that when I began to read it, some of the literary texts, one of them being King Oedipus, I found that King Oedipus is not just about the cars, the predestination, etc., etc., but it is about the act of healing, the act of healing, which is, con which is uh, regarded as the act of pharmacos, as it is said in Greek language. So naturally, we find that the, uh, that Sophocles wanted to transform the text, but why did he do so? This actually leads to the question of the pandemic. When Sophocles was writing King Oedipus at a time around 432 BC, it's between 426 and 432 BC, there are controversies. But uh, during this time, Athens was afflicted with a huge outbreak of plague. And uh, we know that as a result of the plague, one lakh people died only in Athens. So naturally you can see that we, we find that there is a very definitive change because in the original myths, there had been no such case of plague or disease. Uh, well, in Homer's period or even Odyssey, 
in Homer's Iliad, we find two references to King Oedipus. Number one is Iliad Book 4, and another is Iliad Book 23. And again, at the same time, in Odyssey. Now, the question is, there we find that, yes, it was found out that unknowingly, Oedipus killed his father and married his mother, but it says, after that, he lived on for 18 years, and went on reigning over caves and died in a battle, normally. So naturally, there was no question of plague. There was no question of disease. So my idea was why. <laughs> However, <laughs> so I <laughs> the questions of uh, reading the text in a difficult time will be debated. So, in King Oedipus also, I have been locating all such things, how a text comes to be transformed. How a text come, comes to be transformed when it is set against a specific kind of background. So, I'll not really take much time. Uh, I believe that our eminent speakers will be able to, I mean, discuss they are reading, they are rereading of literary texts. And uh, I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to sit through this uh, entire, um, I mean, uh, uh, webinar, but I can't really do so because, um, because I have a deadline to make, I am uh, completing one paper and I have to do it right now today. So therefore, I'll not be able to get to the webinar, but all my best wishes. And with these words, I declare the webinar open. And again, I can see the principal. I congratulate the principal uh, for this wonderful initiative and also the Department of English uh, for their wonderful initiative in organizing this webinar. So thank you very much and give, thank you very much, especially for giving me this opportunity to be with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your address. Next, our special guest, Professor Sharbujit Bishash, Professor, Department of English and Controller of Examination Additional Charge Bakura University will address the session. Thank you, sir, for joining us. And over to you, sir. Uh, I think Shorbojida is muted. Hello. Am I audible? Hello. Yes, yes. Yes, yeah. this is audible. Yeah. Uh, thank you for... Uh, hello. Thank you for inviting me to speak uh, during, at the start of this webinar, which is being organized by the Department of English, Borjora College. Uh, as I was saying, because my mic was mute, I'll, I'll just repeat what I said. Uh, I was a part of Borjora College. That is, I worked at Borjora College between um, 2000, uh, 2010 and 2015, that is over five years, I was associated with Borjura College. And so it's a very happy occasion for me to uh, see that the Department of English of Borjura College has taken this wonderful initiative because uh, at the time I was there at Borjura College, I, I had the opportunity to organize uh, a few 
conferences. Uh, I remember uh, it was uh, in uh, it was first first to third August two thousand ten. Uh, we had Professor Anna Garcia Arroyo. She is from the University of Rovira y Virgili, Tarragona, Spain. She came for a three-day lecture series, and she was actually the first international visitor to Borjora College. Uh, that was in 2010 August. I also remember uh, uh, in February 2012. we had an ugly ugc sponsored international seminar where uh, one of the where the chief guest was our uh, honorable vice chancellor professor devnarayan bondopadhyay and we there is borjora college also had the opportunity of welcoming professor geraldine forbes jerry is from uh, the new york state university new york and she was with us for that international conference uh, in february 2012 uh, i also remember uh, in 2013 july our honorable vice chancellor once again visited our college borjora college for another uh, national seminar ugc sponsored national seminar uh, so i i have a very good i have very good memories about Uh, the college and uh, the work we had done so i congratulate the department and uh, i i i congratulate uh, dr arun kumar roy the principal and the also the organizers of this conference for bringing everyone together and uh, deciding on a title which is very much relevant today because we are removing this disciplines that is we are going beyond disciplines nowadays disciplines do not matter everything is interdisciplinary ultimately uh, that is how things are moving forward in all areas and uh, vice chancellor sir also spoke about the rereading of text that is part of your topic and so uh, i believe i can have i had a look at the speakers and i believe that there would be some wonderful discussions over the next two days uh and i am once again very happy to be part of this thank you for uh giving me the opportunity to speak to you and share my thoughts with you uh i would not be able to sit through the entire webinar for two days but i i i wish you best of luck and thank you dr arun kumar roy for inviting me thank you thank you thank you sir thank you so much for joining with us okay so up next we have the lecture session commencing with our first speaker of the day dr shormishtha chatterjee srivastava Dr. Sharmista Chatterjee Srivastav is associate professor and former head of the Department of English at Alia University, Kolkata, West Bengal. Dr. Chatterjee has a teaching experience of over 20 years. Her doctoral thesis is on Indian poetry in English. She is trained in English language teaching from EFLU, Hyderabad. her areas of interest include modern linguistics and lang english language teaching south asian literature shakespeare translation studies post colonialism partition eco criticism gender studies dr chatterjee has been a ugc trainer associate from 2007 to 13 in the scheme titled capacity building for women managers in higher education she has also been a trainer and resource person in many faculty development projects throughout west bengal she has over 50 publications in national and international books 
and journals and has authored a book titled Language and Power, a study of the works of Amitav Ghosh, published by Lamp Lambert Publishers, Germany. She has also edited an anthology of translated short stories entitled Missing Links, Stories from Bengal and Beyond, Authors Press, New Delhi. Her recent publications include Travel Writing, Travel in Writing, co-edited with Dr. Tajuddin Ahmed, published by Vishwakos Parishad. A research article, The Man, the Prostitute, the Child, and the Dog, Whose Partition Is It Anyway? in the Partition of India, Beyond Improbable Lines, co-edited. She is also the advisor and resource person in the Bengal Partition Repository, an Indo-Bangladesh endeavor under the ages of Netaji Shubhas Open University, Kolkata. Dr. Chatterjee has also authored a book titled Communication published, uh, titled English Communication, published by Cambridge, UK. Ma'am is joining us shortly. Please stay with us.
హలో ఎస్ మ్యామ్ హలో గుడ్ మార్నింగ్ ఎస్ ఎస్ మ్యామ్ గుడ్ మార్నింగ్ థాంక్ యూ మ్యామ్ ఫర్ జాయినింగ్ us థాంక్ థాంక్ యూ మ్యామ్ మ్యామ్ యు కెన్ స్టార్ట్ విత్ ద లెక్చర్ సెషన్ కెన్ ఐ yes okay, ma'am thank, thank you benji yes thank ma'am you. thank you for can joining can you see me can yes, you see yes, me yes yes ma'am okay 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 uh, uh, a very good morning to all of you i take this opportunity to thank the authority of uh, borjura college who have made this webinar possible i particularly also thank uh, professor sheik benazir for inviting me to share my thoughts at this uh, platform uh, today i uh, speak on class consciousness and uh, gender trouble in shakespeare and misamanite's uh, dream uh, let me uh, begin in this way uh, uh, we all uh, this is a very common text and we all have done uh, a misamanite dream Uh, sometimes or the other students have studied teachers have taught but it is perhaps very common to read uh, shakespeare's romantic comedies as tales of love and uh, history uh, plays uh, tales of love and history plays as alibis to recreate contemporary political conditions uh, however readings of the latter type could easily spill over to the former under the lens of prying and alert readers it might not be outrageous therefore to claim and therefore subsequently prove that shakespeare a mitsumanite dream is a play about the different faces of authority and uh, in a political context uh, it could be an attempt to negotiate with such authorities to elicit the best for the many i'll explain this uh, what is best for the many uh, in the course of the uh, talk um, now i i'm going to quote leonard uh, tenenhaus uh, who feels uh, i quote for all the differences romantic comedy and chronicle history they use the same rhetorical strategy to produce political order uh, um out of sexual and political relations respectively that is the transform patriarchal hierarchies into a state of discord for the purpose of creating two bases for authority and the two competing hierarchies of power uh, we'll see how in uh, the midsummer night dream there will be uh, this way two competing hierarchies of power um, that of uh, theseus and of oberon so uh, i continue uh, which only the monarch can hold together in a harmonious discord to this end shakespeare uses his drama to authorize political authority and political authority as he represents it in turn authorize art and court taking a cue therefore from tenen house uh, a mitsumanite stream thus becomes a veritable seat of warring authorities uh, those who have read the text and uh, those who know the text students for students especially you know that there is the old etius you know is the father who is very possessive about the daughter there are lovers who claim their own uh, beloveds and there are these two kings who continuously fight uh so uh, definitely at one end therefore stands egeus uh, his archaic obsolete monolithic face of domination on the other hand end stands oberon who enjoys being the king of misrule i think uh, we all uh, uh, enjoy his misrule to some extent the mantle falls on theseus to balance the ego uh and uh, um, this ego is i would read it as egeus and id i would read it as oberon with this intelligent revolutionized and involved re- evolved i would say super ego it is in theseus that the reader is able to identify the face of a modern tolerant democrat authority now there are other readings mind you Uh, where theseus is uh, described to be a uh, very autocratic a person who basically uh, oh, you know uh, dominates over a uh, ty- uh, dominates over hippolyta yes it's true to some extent but you know not the entire story mm, uh, so uh, so he's able to actually overrule the uh, few i would say erroneous if not bad to for the good of the many now in the opening scene if you read uh, the lovers are defensive 
uh, set against the hostility of Aegeus and the more restrained, regretful opposition of Theseus. Aegeus's lecture to Lysander presents love from an outsider's point of view, a trivial, a deceitful, a disruptive of good order. And I quote, Thou hast by the moonlight at his window sung with feigning voices, verses of feigning love, and stolen the impression of a fantasy. This is the father about the daughter, and uh, this is the father scolding the lover as to how he has stolen away the daughter. Uh, although the conflict between Hermia and her father is basically a difference of perception. Uh, Hermia says later on, how is it perception? Hermia says, I would my father looked but with my eyes and Theseus. He, uh, he, he sort of uh, uh, advises Hermia, rather your eyes must with his judgment look. Now this is typical of, you know, what we can call a generation gap. Uh, Aegeus' acquisition is serious and harsh when he compares Lysander to a thief. Of more serious implication is a subsequent acquisition and his ire of being denied his property. With, I quote, with cunning hast thou filched my daughter's heart, filched, snatched away, turned her obedience, which is due to me, stubborn harshness. That means, you know, uh, the daughter's heart can be taken away, snatched, as if, you know, you take away a shuttle or a property. And further on, I quote, as she is mine, I may dispose of her, which shall be either to this gentleman or to her death. So I can dispose my property uh, and this will be according to law. The confidence is in thoughtless cruelty with which Aegeus summarizes his judgment to his daughter reveals and represents this nature of political authority at the mac microcosmic level, authority which is exclusive, narrow per force, but also containing the seeds to trigger potential rebellion of the subjects. And there will be rebellion, we will see all throughout the play, the lovers don't listen at all. Okay. Uh, interestingly and necessarily, authority takes patriarchal color and for most part the play engages itself in attempting to control errant females. And who are these errant females? Hermia, Hippolyta, or Titania. Although Hippolyta is quiet, we will see, she has a zeal of fire in her. She is not that, the gentle soul, which we see her to be. She has preservations. A Midsummer Night's Dream thus becomes a play about politics. One group of people trying to control another in various manifestations. I quote Kate Millett. The term politics shall refer to power structured relationships, arrangements whereby one group of people is controlled by another. By way of parenthesis, one might add that although an ideal politics might simply be conceived as an arrangement of human life on agreeable and rational principles, uh, from whence the entire notion of power over others should be banished, one must confess that this is not what constitute the political as we know it, unquote. Elsewhere Millet, she takes a cue from Max Weber's definition of her shaft, explains the relationship between sexes throughout history as a relationship of dominance and subordinance, and detects this in the social order whereby males rule females. Hence, Aegeus's mm, domination of Hermia, Demetrius's arrogant rejection of Helena, uh, you know that uh, uh, Helena keeps on loving Demetrius and Demetrius very rudely keeps on rejecting her in favor of Hermia. So this is also a kind of, you know, a domination, a kind of egoism that we see operating in the play. Uh, Lysander's temporary desertion of Hermia, all could be. Lysander, when the love juice is sprinkled into his eyes later on in the play, you will see that Lysander, you know, uh, deserts Helena temporarily, forgetting all about the earlier love. Um, uh, and all it could be traced to the system which Kate Millet chooses to call as, I quote, interior colonization. I quote further, it is this system that appears to be more sturdier than any form of segregation and more rigorous than class stratification, more uniform, certainly more enduring. Sexual dominion obtains never the less as perhaps the most pervasive ideology of our culture. 
and provides its most fundamental concept of power." Unquote. By further implication, one might say that Aegeus can be sure and ruthless in his judgment of Hermia because he is less a father and more a patriarch who has in his hands, quote, in short, every avenue of power within the society, including the coercive force of the police, is entirely in his hands, unquote. Yet, Aegeus is authority in the archaic fossilized sense of the term. That means he is only brute force. Authority in the positive sense of the term can be open, can be liberal, which is, as I repeat to you, which will be represented by Theseus. Uh, we are trying to, or I am trying to differentiate these two kinds of authorities. Uh, uh, so his kind of authority would be abhorred by the common Elizabethans in contemporary England. And it is here we try to locate the play in a historical context, um, whose queen and later King James I had to accommodate to a certain May festivities, pagan rituals, fun frolic and abandon advocated by the lover and the fairies in a Midsummer Night's Dream. Again, as Stenenhall writes, I quote, various forms of carnival, and please understand these carnivals were historically, you know, very common during the Elizabethan times, festivities, fun and frolic. So various forms of carnival, particularly those associated with May Day festivities, that means the springtime, the summertime, which was very short-lived. If you remember, you know, uh, Sonnet 18, which talks about the very short-lived summertime to which the, uh, the lover is compared to. So this is a very uh, coveted time. So therefore, you see, uh, uh, particularly those associated with May Day festivities became increasingly controversial during Elizabeth's reign. These were evidently viewed as recalcitrant practices uh, that persisted despite the Reformation and as such were considered to be sacrilegious by certain radical Protestant factions. These reformers bolstered the theological arguments with economic and political ones, claiming that festival pastimes and May games interrupted the work week, distracted um, um, uh, appendices, interfered with economic productivity, and mocked established forms of order. So in other words, uh, the May Day festivities could not be encouraged because it directly affected the, uh, the, the economy or you know the work day of uh, the particular uh, historical time or the Elizabethan period. We continue, considering the above, Hippolytus' serious approach to pastime and recreation is relevant in regard to the farcical dramatic presentation of Bottom and his crew, customarily recognized as marginals in the class hierarchy, as socially excluded, and apprentices who were potential threats to the work culture and economic productivity of contemporary markets. Uh, and Hippolyta's words are very important, uh, almost you know, voicing uh, another form of authority. I quote, I love not to see wretchedness overcharged and duty in his service perishing, unquote. Uh, so in a way, you know, uh, Hippolyta uh, is uh, uh, reserved, uh, her, has her own reservations, I would say. In a way, uh, she is not the Theseus, you know, allowing everything. Uh, she has her own pride. Um, I continue. Certainly, Elizabeth's government felt some threat in the figures of inversion and boundary dissolution. That means the boundaries between the elite and to the class, the working class, the plebeians, uh, those represented by Bottom and his crew. And yet the government's response was mixed. On one hand, as Tally Brass has argued, when Elizabeth's accession day, 17th November, became a national holiday, it was clearly an attempt on the part of the state to harness and appropriate the forces of misrule. On the other hand, Elizabeth was careful not to rouse opposition to the central administration, either by actively supporting traditional festival celebrations or by enforcing rules that would suppress them. And the normal course would have it, the commoners remained largely uncomfortable with the state of affairs, as Lysander would say. So the policy, you know, uh, so Lysander, let me, let me finish this quote. Uh, Lysander would say, I quote, why should not I then prosecute my right, unquote. 
so you know the 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 um, attitude or the uh, i would say the uh, the management of the authority was not very clear as to you know what was the approach it was a mixed approach you know trying to on one hand uh, sort of um, allow a bit of freedom at the same time not to let it go out of hand we come to then the other world also the world of books oberon's domain is projected as the other extremity where the primeval instincts of love lust and eroticism are unleashed under the disguise of a carnival instituted by error and hospitality this is another carnivalist world an uninhibited therefore you know the idea of eat as i mentioned earlier this is an imaginary topsider with them and an abandonment abandonment of spirit which is a common which a common elizabethan would only dream and hence the title so this is a topsy turvy world this is not the real world so the title a midsummer night's dream oberon the stands as the other extreme of authority loving caring but at the same time he could be careless yet jealously protecting one's petty interests at the cost of wreaking havoc in the world of nature and state if you remember you know uh, early in the play uh, there is a, a topsy turvy dam also in the nature which is uh, uh, according to uh, you know puck and the others you know a result of the direct confrontation of the quarrel between oberon and titania i quote therefore the winds piping to us in vain as in revenge have sucked up from the sea contagious fogs and quote there are many such examples to show how nature has also got disrupted like you know we have during these times of pandemic you know when the authority or the seeming gods themselves have started warring so this could happen you know the idea of nature getting disrupted because of uh, uh, the the warring um, selves uh, the unnaturalness visible in the world of nature is his own irresponsible his oberon's creation a creation resulting from jealousy and a desire to dominate his wife titania whom he accuses of safeguarding the changeling changeling this orphan indian boy she had rescued from a dying indian mother and also because he knew of her love to theseus uh, according to josie alwin oberon and titania stand as contrast to theseus and hippolyta and we all understand this while theseus and hippolyta stand for civilization oberon and titania is all you know abandonment it is the jungle law which prevails and the former lack order and restraint the latter stand for sobriety and patience in other words uh josie alwin's words i quote whereas theseus and hippolyta had been introduced by classical gods framed together status calmly awaiting the solemn wedding ceremony oberon and titania are a long married couple who now enter unceremoniously front the opposite sides of the stage and immediately set to arguing in this they enact the opposite of a proper elizabethan marriage first passion rules them not reason sexual passions and jealousies adulterous disloyalties anger pride and possessiveness secondly this is no home to contain titania as a housewife uh, and for which oberon would be houseband husband houseband um, for fairies wander freely over the world so there is no house which could capture the spirit of uh, oberon just like no house could capture the spirit of titania uh, uh, like uh, um, and thirdly oberon has no convention and control over his wife he does not win her back with his sword like theseus but resorts to underhand conspiracy very bad you know backbiting sort of a very mean kind of uh, politics uh, and strategies Mm, under a conspiracy to get his way so we know therefore you know uh, that uh, oberon and titania uh, you know old couples bickering fighting and uh, here is theseus and hippolyta who are to be wedded and they are so graceful as a couple we continue in a way therefore i move on from josie alwin in a way the inability of oberon as a ruler and organizer is also shadowed in the figure of quins you remember students quins was the manager the director of the play 
the play which happens uh, or was to happen in the honor of the marriage of impending marriage of Theseus and Hippolyta. So Quince was the manager of artisans' drama because he fails to confine the artistic energies of bottom. So you know, um, uh, Quince is almost like Oberon who fails to control Titania, just like Quince. Quince fails to control bottom. Like Titania, who cannot be bound in a home, Bottom's effusions know no control. He wants to be all at once in the play, emerges the real manager when the mechanicals miss his presence. They realize without him, the play cannot be staged. Yet Oberon, like conventional authorities, attempts to dominate Titania and to teach her a lesson, just as he ludicrously sets Puck to act to this end and to do well to the tormented set of lovers only to create a series of mistakes and confusions. Oberon is a king of the woods. Traditionally, a meter tall becomes the comically reversed image of a king and a husband, a small, short man. No, not a man, a creature. Oberon decides to torment Titania for the injury done to him. In a seeming parody of what would later become, those of you who know Tempest, the teachers would definitely know, and uh, you know, parody of Prospero's orders to Ariel in the Tempest. So just like Ariel does a very serious work, Puck does a nonsensical work. Uh, so he orders Puck to squeeze the juice of the little western flower into the eyes of Titania so that she dotes on the next thing she sees on awakening. And this next thing is this comic plotting, apparently, bottom with, a, with an ass's head. One cannot miss the pungent and caustic vein of revenge underlying in the mind of male, unable to control the female, who is conventionally his wife, thereby reiterating and reenacting the same relationship of domination and subordination existing between Aegeus and his daughter Hermia. Yet, if a Midsummer Night's Dream is a play about subversion and challenging the authority, Hermia, Helena, Lysander, or Hippolyta refuse to be tied down. They are not, you know, they are rebellious spirits. They demand for and ultimately obtain relaxation and justice. Often protests are against the immediate male counterparts who exhibit Aegeus' spirit in miniature form. Usually devoted souls willing to be spaniel in the sprighty females would not brook any injustice on the part of their men. Helena, on being seduced by Dramatius, says, and I quote, and now both rivals to mock Helena trim exploit the manly enterprise to conjure tears up in a poor man maid's eyes with a derision, unquote. Or Hermia, on spotting Lysander, quote, but why unkindly didst thou leave me so, unquote. These are no doubt questions and anxieties, but they do bring out minds those who would not surrender to circumstances easily. Added to these fiesty fighters is Titania, who refuses to cower before the monstrous ego of Oberon. But there is a futile question put forward. Am I not, thy lord? Before Titania brings in a series of overtures against her lord, that is Oberon, she asserts, then I must be thy lady. So if you are my lord, I am your lady. So she is not to be put down and cowered down. Uh, and uh, uh, she's quick to retort. Uh, he is quick to retort Oberon. These are forgeries of jealousy. Yet Titania, coupled with Oberon, lacked the discipline and decorum associated with political authority. So I repeatedly say that they are not the face of the ideal political authority, though they try their best to manage their fairy world. As elaborated earlier, they are the worst dreams come true, where a queen can step down to dote on a rude Athenian mechanical bottom with an ass's head. Indeed, a severe breach in the Elizabethan class hierarchies and social stratification. Here in my idea that there are breaches, but there are also, there is a sort of a maintenance and occasional lapses in this class hierarchy. Of the structure of Elizabethan society, A.L. Rouse writes, I quote, it exemplified an organic structure which recognized a principle it was based on hierarchical order in which social class expressed social functions. People knew their place in it, where they stood, and how they were expected to behave. 
always with the margin of exceptions. Unquote. Oberon and Titania's leadership therefore threatens to shake the very foundations of this organic structure precisely because of this very reason. Theseus has to step in as an alternative figure, as the figure of the reality. Theseus is the sketch of a real life ruler, noble from the Chaucerian and the Renaissance humanist model. In Peel's arraignment of Paris, the golden apple is awarded to nymph Eliza, the queen in the audience that is outside the play. Lily in Endymion has a Cynthia preside within the action. Shakespeare's sovereign does not simply preside, he is dramatized, dramatized in his own princely activities and qualities are depicted. He has turned conqueror from war against Thebes as well as against the Amazons and celebrated victory. He tries a cause in the light of Athenian constitution and even ally exercises his prerogative in the interest of equity. I quote, Aegeus, I shall overbear your will. So he will not tolerate all the nonsensical disruptions of Aegeus. For in temple, by, by with us, these couples shall eternally be knit. Unquote. Unlike Oberon, Theseus does not make the lovers power in the game of his fancy. Unlike Oberon, he does not need a minister to delegate justice, nor does create chaos and disorder which lacks, which results from lack of diplomacy and pre-planned action. Theseus is accustomed to go on progress to receive the addresses of his subjects. And as the Renaissance prince educated in humanistic disciplines, exacts to appreciate loyal orations from learned men. He goes hunting uh, those who have read Twelfth Night. Orsino also hunts, so he is like Orsino, elite, fashionable. Accompanied by his no less keen and expert lady, Hippolyta, with his well chosen pack of hounds. And his hounds don't kill him down like Actaeon in the legends. It is true that Theseus, like the other wooers, had won Hippolyta by the sword and would be her master by all conventional social standards. But love and concern for Hippolyta's sentiments and desires find an upper hand. I quote, Hippolyta, I wooed thee by with my sword and won thy love doing the injuries, but I will wed thee in another key with pomp and triumph and with reveling, unquote. Here is where we see, you know, he is not the dominant person uh, against, I go against the traditional conventional readings, which also see Theseus to be the patriarch. You know, he could have won uh, a Titania, sorry, Hippolyta by sword, but he is, uh, uh, he is a passionate lover. He, he means what he says. Theseus is an individual devoted to artistic as well as physical recreation. He's a patron of music, drama, poetry, and these activities, I quote, help him to give his realm a degree of this world actuality to contrast with dream characteristics and magic in the fairy other world, as does the association still made between him and the veritable sovereign, Queen Elizabeth, made briefly when he affirms himself a constitutional ruler as she, like all the Tudors, was at pains to do. He resembles Elizabeth in his genuine feeling for his people, even for the artisans in their play and the high value he sets on their feeling for him. Uh, now, later on, you see, um, while Elizabeth was uh, uh, the real monarch, you know, she was tolerant somewhat, you know, and uh, strategized, you know, uh, her relationship with the uh, mechanicals or with the common people. James, uh, the later monarch, you know, James the first, uh, he was much more restricted, you know, and dominant. He clamped down the rules. Uh, um, so you see, uh, uh, the uh, the Jacobian age, you know, with the coming of the James the first, you know, the Jacobian age demanded new kinds of faces of authority, a stricter face of authority. So, you know, in Theseus, we possibly can see, you know, this kind of oscillating, you know, the, the liberal monarch and uh, slightly rigid monarch. So while Theseus conforms to the nobility of Elizabeth, he's also faced with the challenge of the populace to transform himself into a new monarch who would introduce the concept of the power of blood, however wild it might seem to be. 
evidently Shakespeare's description of Oberon this foreshadows the Jacobian rule to a certain extent. So, you know, what we cannot find in Theseus, we find the James the first version in Oberon, perhaps, you know, in his very, very, I would say, you know, vengeful kind of uh, rule, which he carries on. So uh, uh, Theseus, you know, while he stands on the fringes of this rule and a more powerful, rigid rule, Oberon is altogether in the in the domain of this, uh, uh, I would say, rigidity and also to some extent misrule. Yet one must understand, while Theseus remains a figure of fact and balance, a soothing, benevolent father figure, Obinon at best can be a product, and I repeat, of a fanciful world of dreams. I'm coming towards the last part of my lecture. Uh, uh, Benazir, uh, do I have 10 minutes time? Benazir? Professor Benazir, are you there? Okay, yes, carry on. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, just about, uh, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. In the scheme of opposing power strategies and the final stages of the triumph of Theseus and his conception of sovereignty, Bottom and his workmen stage a play, Pyramus and Thisbe. This we all know that they were rehearsing in the woods the play Pyramus and Thisbe, a tragic comedy, which they themselves don't know, you know, what it is. They think that it is a comedy. And they try to do whatever, uh, you know, exactly the opposite of whatever is intended to do. So uh, that's adding to the hilarity and the amusement of the play. Uh, they ultimately also amuse the pair, uh, pairs of lovers and also Theseus and Hippolyta. Importantly, the trope is used by the dramatists, uh, not only as a comic relief, but also to bring out with finality the status of the root mechanicals and the class hierarchy in spite of all the well-meaning gestures of Theseus. So Theseus tries to be sober, but he actually lets away, you know, the fact that then he's good. But, you know, he cannot just overrule the glass hierarchy. There's something inside brewing. Diana De Devlin finds Bottom to be, I quote, like the hero of the Holy Grail romance, achieving the restoration of peace and fruitfulness in the land except that he does it quite unknowingly and without actually doing anything, unquote. As readers, it cannot be forgotten, however, that Bottom is here at the best in uh, the ironic sense. He could be rightly compared to a hero in the sense when Oron Atkinson, uh, Mr. Bean, those who know Mr. Bean, Rowan Atkinson, tries to parody the role of James Bond in Johnny English. The sanity of the message might not be missed. The artisans might dream of uh, becoming lovers to the queens. So, you know, you can uh, do many things in your dreams. So becoming lovers to the uh, queen. Um, the love of Pyramus and Thisbe, uh, true love as Pyramus and Thisbe would, but uh, would not go without the absurdity and the pain of wearing an ass's head along with the harsh comments of the spectators of the play. So the, so the, uh, the, the rude mechanicals are, uh, mechanicals are showed their status, actually. Um, you can dream to love the queen, of course. You know, dreams knows no bound, uh, no, no bounds. But um, you got to have an ass's head. So, you know, your position is fixed. You cannot climb. Uh, uh, so, so um, you know, uh, the spectators of the play, as I told you, you know, they, they all belong to the, uh, to the higher class, the upper class, and they actually laugh at this whole phenomenon of the uh, ambition of the mechanicals. At best, comic actors like Bottom can be used as pawns in the game of higher powers. In this case, his part is scripted by Puck. So Puck has already, you know, uh, Puck had come, if you remember, you know, Puck had come in between and seen the rude mechanicals practice in the grove, in the woods, and uh, decided that he would play, you know, the real manager and not Queens in making this drama happen. So this is largely designed by Puck um, to be used, and he uses this to resolve the tiff, the quarrel between his lord and lady, that is Oberon and uh, Titania. Moreover, the play is shortlisted by the monarch, not because of its potential artistic quality. So there are no, you know, um, uh, no doubts that uh, no assumption should be made that it, it had any artistic quality. If you know, you know, uh, it is a 
um, tragedy made into a comedy, so a very hybrid kind of a genre. Uh, but because, uh, uh, as Theseus finds, an excuse to show his large heartedness. So, uh, you know, like Elizabeth uh, uh, in the real life trying to show what a liberal queen she was. Um, those who know, you know, of a Netflix series, please don't mind, you know, I'm uh, referring to Netflix, The Crown, you know. And this shows how, you know, uh, the later on, this is not about, uh, definitely not about the earlier Elizabeth, but the later Elizabeth. But again, it's a, it's a story of the royal family. And there, you know, uh, there are episodes which show how uh, the queen on the popular pressure and on, on the popular advice, you know, she tries to meet the commoners. But, you know, uh, once uh, uh, at home, behind the closed doors, she regrets, you know, uh, there is a lot of talk as to how the royal family has to come down. They lose their prestige, you know, when they try to mingle with the commoners. Exactly the same thing. This is what also, you know, Theseus tries to uh, act, I would say, in a way uh, to show his large heartedness. And so, so you know, uh, Theseus shows his large heartedness in receiving such offering as the subjects make to him. When Hippolyta complains, the actors, I quote, can do nothing in this kind, and Hippolyta continuously has her reservations, although she is very sweet. He retorts, he scolds his wife as a part of diplomacy, and I quote, the kinder we to give them thanks for nothing, unquote. Thus bringing out the essential diplomacy of a monarch. As quoted by Harry Payne, and with this I am going to uh, end, I quote, a new aristocracy of fiscally responsible, rational intellectuals as the proper agents of moral reform. By engaging the artisans in an artistic experience, authority would also create a scope for them to win of sixpence a day, whereby the reality remains laced with an illusion, just like the illusion with reality. Bottom can utter his last speech, according to Diana Devlin, with a glimmering awareness of the beautiful woman whom he nearly possessed, but who died to him. The beautiful woman can never be his. And I borrow the term from Amur Tushin. He is a, I quote, socially excluded, included only and selfishly to cement the strategies which strengthen, and I quote, bottom lines to maintain social stratification and power hierarchy within the society. Thank you so much. Professor Benazir, I am done yes. with, if there are any questions, comments. Yes, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Just one second. I'm going to check this one. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, sorry to say, but there are no questions yet in the chat box actually okay. the students no, here no are not problem. yet accustomed with the system i have been repeatedly okay. telling them but thank you ma'am for okay. that wonderful lecture and thank you for the sparing time from your busy schedule thank you so much and um, thank you for inviting me i was delighted to be with you uh, i hope thank it you. made some sense and yes ma'am i mean your students yes Okay, yes, it's okay. Yes, thank, thank you, thank you, Professor thank you. Benazi. Thank you so much. Okay. May I log thank out then? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, may I log out? Okay, thank yes. you. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. Our our next speaker is Mr. Ayan Mondal of Bakura Christian College. Mr. Ayan Mondal is a gold medalist of the University of Bardwan, standing first in the first class in his master's in 2010, following his second position among all students of the university in his graduation. He joined the Department of English, Bakura Christian College in 2011 as an assistant professor and is teaching in both the undergraduate and the postgraduate wings of the department since then. He has submitted his PhD thesis on whiteness studies and the 19th century American classics very recently. 
he has presented papers in various national and international conferences and has some publications to his credit on whiteness studies post 1950s british literature among other areas of interest mr mondol has served as an invited guest faculty in the pg departments of bakura university and muc women's college bardwan for quite a long time he is in the editorial board of the peer reviewed national journal spring and has also served as an editor of the reputed journal of the department of english bakura christian college appropriations at present he is the head of department of english ug and pg bakura christian college thank you so much sir for joining with us over to you sir so can you hear me uh, i can hear you distinctly am i audible and visible both yes yes sir yes sir okay 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 um, sir uh first of all uh, at the outset i would like to uh, thank uh, the bodjara college authority uh, the principal of bodjara college the faculty members of the uh, department of english and uh, benazir the coordinator of this webinar for extending this warm invitation uh, to address the students primarily uh, my regards also to uh, dr uh, shormish chatterjee srivastav uh, i had the privilege of listening to her for the first time today uh, precisely keeping in mind the interests of the students i have entitled my lecture Uh, the dystopian fantasy rereading dickens's hard times uh i have chosen this particular text hard times uh, uh not merely uh, for the reason that uh, it is prescribed in the undergraduate syllabi of uh, most of the universities uh but also because uh, as a text it is very close to my heart and when i use the word heart in respect of a novel like hard times uh, the word in fact acquires various ramifications i will be dealing with that very shortly uh, before i begin my lecture i obviously assume that uh, the students again i'm underlining that uh, there is nothing revolutionary in my paper uh, because i am uh, directly addressing the students so i assume that the students are well acquainted uh, with the text or at least uh, uh, a detailed overview of the story line now to return back to the uh, title of my lecture as i already told uh, it is the dystopian fantasy uh, now uh, this entire lecture in fact would be a uh, drive towards uh, justifying uh, the title of my lecture so therefore uh, before i uh, get into my lecture per se i would first like to throw some light on the different areas uh, that i would be touching uh, in this lecture first i would like to deal with uh, the different factors uh, let us say the immediate factors uh, that resulted in the composition of hard times uh, shaping and molding its form are uh, the financial the social and biographical details there so that is the that is going to be the first uh, part of my talk uh, very shortly and in the next sub sections gradually i would try to present how dickens uh, sort of tries to address fuse and connect the many different thematic threads you know in this novel what kind of thematic threads and i'm underlining this and this is very important first his scathing criticism of the utilitarian philosophy second his critique and exploration of the industrial relations in the then victorian times third his equal focus on uh, you know critiquing the education system in the then victorian england and uh, finally uh, you know even when he addresses these issues how he also throws light on the domestic space the familial space so these are uh, the different areas that i would first like to touch upon uh, in this lecture and then i would try to connect these things with 
you know, the, the, the very expression dystopian fantasy, which uh, was addressed by a critic. I will be coming to that uh, uh, very shortly afterwards. Now, uh, to come back to the first part, that is the background uh, uh, of the novel, the publication details, uh, if I am to be a bit more specific. Uh, we are all aware that uh, Dickens is almost a self-made literary artist. Uh, he, he suffered from his very childhood. He has suffered the very bad turns of his misfortune, of his destiny, not being able to complete education, uh, uh, beginning uh, his, uh, you know, career as a leader of uh, labels and Uh, Am I audible now? Hello, am I audible now? So we can't Hello? hear you. So we can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Hello. Hello? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, uh, Yes, you are okay. audible now. Okay, okay. so uh, how much did you miss? So I think the last two lines. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. So I was uh, uh, talking about uh, the different turns of destiny that uh, Dickens had to face. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, you know, uh, uh, he walked uh, in various threads, in various professions, and uh, as a shorthand reporter in law courts, even as a parliamentary reporter, a contributor of stories to different newspapers and magazines, before, bit by bit, you know, earning fame as an acclaimed fiction writer of his times. And it was, in fact, a prolific journey of Dickens, uh, from Oliver Twist to our mutual friend as a journey as a fiction writer. Now, when I come to hard times specifically, uh, Dickens started writing hard times. It was in January 1854. Uh, having completed another very important social novel, Bleak House. Uh, in fact, let me tell you that uh, having completed Bleak House, Dickens badly needed a rest, but he could not enjoy the rest because of certain pressures. And the pressure came uh, primarily from uh, the printers of the magazine that he was running. The name of the magazine was Household Words. It was a weekly periodical, which uh, by January 1854 had run five years of continuous publication. And in the second half of 1853, and this was the immediate cause behind Dickens's uh, taking up this project, taking up of this project. So in the second half of 1853, there was an alarming fall on the sales of this particular periodical. So uh, the printers of this periodical sort of requested Dickens to serialize a fresh novel in this magazine. And as expected, Dickens immediately agreed to the proposal to rescue the magazine Household Words from its state of crisis. It was in January 23. 1854, that Dickens had completed writing the first page of Hard Times. And, you know, uh, the, the sales of the magazine saw a steep rise after that time, as expected, obviously. It was a big, big hit from the very first number in, in that magazine. That was the first immediate cause. The second cause was Dickens's visit to Preston in late January 1854. And, uh, you know, there was a prolonged hurtal, a strike uh, at Preston, very popularly known as the Preston Strike. And Dickens visited the spot as a, you know, as a reporter in 1854. And Dickens uh, witnessed the horrific conditions of the workers there. So because the times were coinciding, Dickens's visit to uh, the uh, Preston spot, and his beginning of the 
you know, drafting of hard times, critics have tried to connect the novel's preoccupation with the industrial relations, with the very hard tal, with the very strike at Preston. So Dick, though, you know, Dickens indignantly suggested that the novel was conceptualized far in advance of his visit to Preston. So that was a critical argument. Dickens did not quite agree that his visit to Preston was integrally, integrally related to the publication of Hard Times. So uh, that was the second reason. And in the third part, let me tell you, if one gets back into some of the letters composed by Dickens in 1853, one also finds their references to many things which are, you know, major uh, thematic occupations of Dickens in hard times. What are those things? Education, schooling experiences, teachers training programs. And these things are, you know, very explicitly present in hard times. So these things, as Dickens mentions sporadically in those letters, letters composed mostly in the summer of 1853. So these things also must have shaped some of the thematic thrusts of hard times. And if one follows the not on edition of the text, one finds an entry there. Dickens's comments on the composition of hard times. I'm not going into the details. There, one would find that uh, you know Dickens himself admits that the concept of the novel was very much there, much in advance of his visit to Preston. So these are the three. You know, there are also many other factors. I'm not going into the details, but you know, in a nutshell, these are the three primary factors which resulted in Dickens's, you know, taking up of this project. Now, uh, the, at the outset, I have already told you that I expect that you've read the text, but to just, uh, you know, once again, repeat, to just give you a very brief outline in three to four sentences of the text. Uh, in the main plot of the text, we have uh, a character called Thomas Grad Grind, you know, uh, a typical product of the utilitarian machinery who rears his children up in the in the same system, the utilitarian system. He, he marries his daughter off to Mr. Bounderby, who was also an arrogant uh, owner of an industry and who falsely claims that I am a self-made man. Bounderby was actually Grad Grind's friend. So he was much older than his daughter Luza. But Gradgrind made it a point to marry off his daughter to Mr. Bounderby. But ultimately, you know, Gradgrind's system proves fallacious. It is proved in the novel itself. The utilitarian, the utilitarian system that I was referring to, that is proved fallacious. Why? Gradgrind's son ends up getting exposed as a thief. And the marriage that Gradgrind used to boast of the marriage of his daughter Luza with Bounderby, that marriage also turns disastrous. Bounderby meets a catastrophic plight at the end. So that is, uh, you know, something that takes place in the main plot of the novel. And there is a parallel plot. If I do not use the word subplot, I should say a parallel plot that is running in the novel. What is it? It is concerning a very honest factory worker whom I love to say the Dickensian prototype in the text, who is Stephen Blackpool. And we find in that plot that Stephen gets crushed in, in various ways uh, there uh, by his own fellow workers. So Stephen was a worker at Bounderby's factory. He gets crushed by his own fellow men. He gets crushed, of course, by Mr. Bounderby, the owner of the factory. He also gets crushed in many ways by his own drunkard wife who keeps on bullying him intermittently. However, he becomes the most pathetic uh, figure in the novel because uh, he evokes the pity of the readers and he meets a catastrophic death. We are all aware of that. And the saving grace in Stephens' life was an angelic figure who was not his wife, of course, but it was Rachel, his companion, Rachel was, in fact, a Christ figure, an angelic figure there who stood by Stephen through thick and thin. Now, uh, having discussed this, 
Now what needs to be considered is to what extent this Dickensian narrative almost hinges on the dystopic stream. For that, we have to consider some distinctive domains of the text, as I've already told you. I begin with the first domain. How, what is the text relation with this utilitarian philosophy? How does the text expose, explore, and critique the utilitarian system or the utilitarian machinery? A word or two on this utilitarian philosophy first, before I come into the textual elaboration. You know, utilitarianism as a philosophy, uh, it was very much associated with Jeremy Bentham. I, I will al also address another important thing, the, the laissez-faire economy very shortly. But first, let me talk about utilitarian philosophy. It was very much associated with Jeremy Bentham. The root word, of course, as we all know, was utility. And it, it, it kind of assured an action that would account for bringing about the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people as the superior or supreme action. So it, it relied on this happiness principle that only matters which serve our utility, activities which serve our immediate utility and which cause the greatest happiness, only those activities, you know, are to be counted and such an activity is an ideal kind of activity. So that was the major you know, argument in this utilitarian philosophy. Let me tell you that Bentham first proposed it in his 1789 book, Principles of Morals and Legislation, uh, that was re-explored again by John Stuart Mill in his book, Utilitarianism, later on, uh, long after the publication of Hard Times. But this theory, let me tell you, has its roots in, again, another Epicurean philosophy, hedonist philosophy. There also, what was the main thrust of Epicurean philosophy? Uh, they were also out to pursue only pleasure. And they used to consider only those attributes important, which held that a primary way of attaining pleasure was to gain knowledge of the workings of the world, something that echoes Gradgrind's dictum, facts, 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 and nothing but facts. And I also talked about a, an economic system, which probably I would be uh, talking a bit when I take up the industrial issue that is paramount in this novel. That is the laissez-faire economy. Um, laissez-faire, you know, it comes from the French verb, uh, meaning leave it to us, let us do it. So an economic system where the owners of the state wanted to exercise their free will without even the intervention of the government. That was the economic uh, drive. That was the main economic desire in this political economic theory, laissez-faire economy. And this theory of political economy was in many ways associated with Adam Smith and uh, also Ricardo. And let me tell you that Gradgrind names one of his children Adam Smith in the course of the novel. Anyways, let me take up this utilitarian issue. Let me connect this philosophy with the text. We find that Thomas Gradgrind in the text is a typical votary of such an utilitarian machinery, promulgating the philosophy of facts. And that's how the novel begins. Facts, facts, facts. Now what I want is facts. And who is the ideal student of Thomas Gradgrind? The ideal student is, of course, Bizarre, who adopts this machinery and who could parrot the bookish definition of a horse. We remember that famous incident in the novel when, you know, a definition of a horse was sought for and Sissy could not answer the definition and Bizarre came out with a very interesting answer. I wish to quote the answer of Bizar. Bizar was asked, what is a horse? And Bizar replied, quadruped, graminivorous, 40 teeth, namely 24 uh, grinders, four eye teeth, 12 incisive, sheds coat in the spring, marshy countries, sheds hoops to etc, 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 shed with iron age, known by marks of mouth, etc. He gives a dictionary meaning of a horse, anatomizing the parts of the horse. And Dickens makes Sissy in the novel 
a foil to Bizar. CC is incapable of defining a horse and does not subscribe to the education that is propounded by Grad Grind, that relies on numbers. Let me tell you that CC herself is a numbered girl. She is the girl number 20 in the novel. So CC does not subscribe to such an educational system that relies on numbers, statistics, calculations and that's why she is labeled you know she's dehumanized and she's referred to as girl number 20 in the text her her human essence is reduced to a digit her identity gets shaped likewise so that is the second part the system third is gradry names his own house you will be very interested to note the name of the house it is stone lodge he names his children, somebody is Adam Smith, somebody is Malthus. Everything is stony in his house. There are very compartmentalized chambers in the house. The mineralogical cabinet, the metallurgical cabinet, the arithmetical cabinet. Likewise, there are cabinets in his house. Instead of a relaxing room or a drawing room, there are specific cabinets for specific subjects. But we find another world in this chapter and the chapter is entitled loophole this chapter exists as an antidote to grad grimes world a world that is run what is this world it is a domain of circus it is a domain of the entertainers it is a world that is run by fancy and entertainment so fact on the one hand and fancy on the other hand fancy and entertainment the world of the circus and Grand Grind comes there and finds his two children they are peeping through the loophole he Grand Grind takes serious exception that why are you who are Grand Grind's children why are you peeping through that loophole of the circus seeking an entry into the world of fancy and Dickens very consciously titles this chapter loophole because it was not merely a loophole in the circus tent. Dickens was trying to point out that there was a literal loophole in the very Gradgrindian system. So this is how, in a nutshell, utilitarianism is, you know, foregrounded in this novel. But let me tell you that Dickens is not merely foregrounding this. Dickens is equally critiquing it. How is he critiquing it? You know, there are many areas in the text. I have picked up only three major areas that, that sort of highlights this criticism of this utilitarian machinery. Number one, very faintly though, Mrs. Gradgrind, who is on her deathbed, informs Luza that your father has taught you so many things, but there is an ology that your father has missed teaching you. Mrs. Gradgrind could not factually pronounce that ology that she was, that Mr. Gradgrind had missed teaching his children. That is the first thing. Second, in the chapter entitled Down, and that is a very, very important chapter, and the chapter title Down is also very significant. When the dejected and shattered loser, you know, she almost completely dejected and flabbergasted comes to his father and interrogates her father one after the other that why did you marry me to this Mr. Bounderby? What is the outcome? Was it for this? And there I, I am tempted to quote from the text. Luza says, I do not know that I am sorry. I do not know that I am ashamed. I do not know that I am degraded in my own esteem. All that I know is, and I'm underlining these words again, please note, Luza says this to her father, all that I know is your philosophy and your teaching will not save me. Now, father, you have brought me to this. Save me by some other means. Your philosophy is not going to save me now. If you are to save me today, save me, I'm afraid, by some other means. That is the second. And the fittest rebuff 
to this utilitarian philosophy comes when that ideal student of grad grind trained in the grad grind machinery you all know the student who could parrot you know verbatim in a verbatim manner who could parrot the definition of a horse when grad grind's son tom lands in trouble and tom is under the mercy of this student bizar grad grind asks a question to bizar bizar do you have a heart bizar do you have a heart and the reply by bizar is the circulation sir the circulation blood circulation the circulation sir couldn't be carried on without one no man sir acquainted with the facts established by the anatomist harvey relating to the circulation of the blood can doubt that i have a heart i have a heart but that is not the seat of emotions and passions i have only the medical organ called heart and he is mentioning harvey here that is you know a direct dig at the utilitarian machinery dickens is you know sometimes critiquing through his own narratorial voice and sometimes critiquing the system through such characters completely what was grad grind expecting the helpless grad grind was at that time expecting compassion mercy kindness from bizar and all his expectations were shattered subverted topsy turvyed absolutely bizar acted as he was taught and this brings another important dimension i am going to take up the second dimension which is education how is dickens critiquing the education system in this novel and i i want to refer to a monumentally important minute of 1846 under the guidance of james k shuttleworth that set up teachers training programs teachers were trained in specific manners and those teachers were supposed to improve the quote and quote standards of the students i remember the orientation programs the faculty development programs so uh, the b ed courses so this was also a sort of teachers training program and why am i mentioning it the program meant to produce quote and quote qualified instructors to encourage apprentice teachers and why am i mentioning this because in the novel if i am i if i am to ironically use the expression there is in fact a qualified instructor whose name is mr chokam child you can guess from the name itself he chokes he is a teacher who is meant to choke the minds of the students the minds of the children and i i want to draw your attention not merely to the name of the teacher mr chokam child but the title of one particular chapter in this novel which was murdering the innocents and what is mr chokam child up to let me give you a list of the subjects he had expertise and dickens is satirizing he is very ironically sarcastically pointing out this let us read let me read a short portion from uh, the chapter loop hole where it is uh, you know dickens is talking about chokam child he had been put through an immense variety of paces and in his interview as a teacher he had answered volumes of heartbreaking questions questions from which subject oh my god there is not one subject host of subjects that dickens names one after the other orthography etymology syntax prosody biography astronomy geography general cosmography the sciences of compound proportion algebra land surveying and leveling vocal music <clears throat> and drawing from models were all at the ends of his ten chilled fingers we say in english no at his fingertips not one subject 
so many subjects even vocal music jokam child was supposed to sing also they were under his ten chill fingers and you know uh, in fact there is a part there is a passage in the text also which talks about uh, the system uh, in which jokam child was in and the system that he was supposed to uh, subscribe to and disseminate what was it fact 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 everywhere in the material aspect of the town fact 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 everywhere in the immaterial the mr chokam child school was all fact and the school of design was all fact and the relations between master and man were all fact and everything was fact between the lying in hospital and the cemetery and what you couldn't state in figures or show to be purchasable in the cheapest market and this is bizarre's philosophy as well which he repeats in the novel purchasable in the cheapest market and saleable in the dearest market that was not and never should be world without end amen dickens's own comments and in fact in the novel there is a chapter called cc's progress I do not have time to elaborate on the chapter, but I'm just mentioning in the chapter we find how Mr. Chokam Chai literally bullies CC for each wrong answer. When I say wrong answer, I say the answers were only factually wrong. But if you read those instances from the chapter, you will see that each of the answers of CC were smacking of good sense, rationality. social awareness and wisdom were the answers really wrong it was wrong of course in the great grindian sense in the chokam childian sense but not in actuality that's why chokam child meant to choke cc's innocence he could not cc kept his innocence intact kept his good kept her sorry kept her good sense and innocence intact but he was meant as a teacher he was meant to murder the innocence a serious dickensian commentary you find in a novel you know critiquing the education system and let me point out another important domain i have considered utilitarianism i have considered the education system and let me come to the third important domain in the novel what what is it the domain of industrialization does dickens critique the evils of industrialization in this novel we we cannot give a definitive answer now because dickens very much like shakespeare he he was a holistic artist let let me see or let us see how what was dickens take on industrialism let me be very categorical about the fact that Dickens himself denounced the label that was given to hard times industrial novel. He 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 was not ready to accept that label. There were attempts to connect Dickens's visit to Preston, as I have told you, with the novel's preoccupation with industrial relations. But Dickens himself suggested in a letter written to Peter Cunningham that such an interpretation was, I'm quoting from Dickens, altogether wrong. That means he was. refusing to you know get straight jacketed as an industrial novelist however there is no denying that there are certain textual traces in the novel where dickens is almost directly pinpointing the evils and scars of industrialization for instance in the very description of coke town what is coke town the fictionalized locale that dickens is dealing with in this novel in that very description of coke town in the chapter entitled the keynote coke town almost becomes you know an emblem of the, uh, the entire country the entire england why because dickens himself notes in the chapter that coke town bears the scars and stigma of industrialization the unnatural it, it was a town of unnatural red and black that resembles the painted face of a savage so it had a monstrous appearance as a town 
the tall chimneys from where interminable interminable serpents of smoke the word serpent reminds us again in christian theological terms evil so industrialism brings with it its concomitant evils there is no escape from that third the monotonous workings of the steam engines up and down so monotony was a thing there it, it resembled you know a melancholic elephant an elephant in its state of melancholic madness and there was a description of that river it, it, you won't find onodire ekti kotha shudai shudhu tomare there it was a river that reddened that smelled like a dye ill smelling dye a red river it was not a green one it was a red river red and not the natural red it was reddened with the ill smelling dye and i am tempted to quote a critic called olson here olson says hard times presents a natural world metamorphosed into an inferno by the forces of bounder by and grad grind to important you know representative embodiments of industrialization the non existence of green you know greenery in coke town hearts and the countryside it communicates that implicit nature of the denial what do we find in the novel itself i'm quoting just two lines from the novel in the innermost fortifications of that ugly citadel when nature was as strongly bricked out as killing airs and gases were bricked in at the heart of the labyrinth of narrow courts upon courts and closed streets upon streets which had come into existence piecemeal every piece in a violent hurry for some one man's purpose and the whole it it resembled an unnatural family shouldering and trampling and passing sorry pressing one another to death that was from the text not merely that how are the workers described in the novel the workers are described as hands and what does this appellation indicate it indicates again only the mechanized utilitarian drive only that part of the physical bodies of the workers mattered that would cater to the needs of the industrialists that's why they were referred to as hands that's why you know some musicians protest when they are referred to as music hands it is a very derogatory expression in that sense so it was utter dehumanization and reification of the workers stephen also in a very long conversation with bounder by in the text underscores the typical boredom the smugness the sameness the filth the tiring monotony in the lives of the industrial workers now the question is if dickens is you know critiquing the capitalist forces if he is critiquing industrialism then is he shaking hands with one of his contemporaries karl marx is dickens being marxist in this drive and my answer is very categorical a big no a big no why because within this narrative matrix of the text only dickens was really not trying to unidimensionally critique industrialism he was also trying to critique hooliganism in the name of trade unionism and this he does through the character of slack bridge who is a foil to stephen blackpool in the novel how it must be taken uh, you know that through this character slack bridge dickens was equally trying to address the issue of worker solidarity and the revolution that marx had theorized at length we we noted the you know like a political leader the supreme oratorical fits of slack bridge but dickens is critiquing slack bridge dickens shows slack bridge 
as a betrayer. Dickens shows Slackbridge as a traitor. Dickens was trying to undermine this, you know, blind radicalism, hooliganism in the name of criticism of industrialism, in the name of trade unionism. How even Slackbridge could corner and ostracize Stephen for not agreeing to show his spontaneous allegiance to the radical and violent revolution that he was trying to spark. So what, what, what is our inference then? Dickens was not in favor of such gross radicalism. And it was also evident from another instance that Dickens was not in favor of the mechanized drive of the industrialist. Dickens was advocating instead humanism, humanism in all its forms. And if, if, I, if I go through another important uh, incident, let us say, Dickens, uh, you know, Dickens's multidimensional attitude will also uh, be explicit from this incident. Uh, it was evident when Dickens serialized chapter 7 and chapter 8 of the novel, he went through an article, at least an article uh, uh, was published at that time, that title of the article was Ground on the Mill. And in that article, Dickens projected, a, sorry, not Dickens, Henry Morley, I'm extremely sorry, not Dickens it was, Henry Morley projected a very pathetic industrial accident that took place. A factory girl died because, you know, you know, on site in the industry. And Dickens originally made Rachel's sister an embodiment of that factory girl. But later on, and you know, in that passage originally, Dickens made Stephen Blackpool violently protest against the industrialists. But later on, let me tell you, in the final version of the text, Dickens cancelled that passage. What does this cancellation show? That Dickens would not wish Stephen Blackpool to be inhuman or to be irrational. So Dickens's attitude towards industrialism was not a narrow one dimensional one, but it was a holistic one for that matter. Let me now come to the final part in my lecture. You know, how the different social factors impacted even the, even the domestic lives, even the family lives out there. I would be very sketchily addressing uh, some incidents, you know, some relationships to be more specific. What relationships? Say the relationship between Mr. Gradgrind and Mrs. Gradgrind in the novel. We find that Mrs. Gradgrind is almost cornered in the house, enfeebled by the crushing utilitarian machinery. She could not even speak what she always wished to speak, even to her daughter in that chapter. So she is the typical, you know, prototype of Victorian womanhood, the angel in the house. Mr. Gradgrind was the busy man of the world. Mrs. Gradgrind's voice was silenced in the novel. It was a travesty of a husband-wife relationship there. What about the relationship between Luza and her husband, Mr. Bounderby? Yet again, another travesty of a husband-wife relationship. Because it was a loveless marriage. We know several instances in the novel, even when Bounderby kissed Luza for the first time, we know to what extent Luza was rubbing that part. Tom said that, sister, it is going to be of a disastrous consequence. Luza says doesn't matter. It was a loveless marriage. And the same spirit continued all throughout the novel. What about Luza and Mr. Gregright, the father and daughter? In fact, there is a chapter in the novel, Father and Daughter. And the and itself in the chapter title was pretty ironic because there was no connection between the two. There was no understanding between the two. 
and ultimately Luza came to Gradgrind to question the very basis of Gradgrind's philosophies in the chapter I discussed. So that relationship was also a failed relationship, you know, on the domestic, on the familial space. What about the relationship between Bounderby and Mrs. Sparsett? It appeared at the outset that Mrs. Sparsett would take up a position of superiority and authority, but she also failed. What about Harthouse and Luza? Harthouse was sparred by his ego and he meant to trap Luza into his amorous advances. Harthouse also failed there. What about the brother sister relationship? What about Tom and Luza there? It appeared again, it appeared at the outset that it is going to be a very promising and ideal brother sister relationship, you know. They are kind of sufferers and they conjoin and they discuss about uh, the futility of the father system. But it appears in the novel that Tom, the brother, merely uses the sister as a bait to, you know, have some personal favors from Mr. Bounderby. This is about the Gradgrindian and the Bounderbian world. What about the circus world? What about the other domain? So fact versus fancy. What about the other domain in the novel? What about familial relationships there? Let me tell you that Stephen had a very disastrous relationship with his drunkard wife because his wife used to bully him a lot. And he, he wanted to get rid of his wife. He approached Mr. Bounderby, stating very clearly that I want to divorce. And Bounderby there states unequivocally, laws are not meant for you people. Laws are for the rich. There again, there is a Dickensian criticism of the legal machinery, the institution of law. And the only oasis in the deserted life of Stephen was Rachel, the angel in his life. Rachel was a prototype of selfless love. But I, I, I want to discuss about the other world, the circus world, typically. In the circus world, you know, the relationship that Sissy enjoys with her father is a foil to the mechanical relationship of Luza with Mr. Gradgrind. Because it was a very genuine, very authentic, very sympathetic, affectionate relationship between the daughter and the father there, Sissy and the father there. Second, the entire circus group that was led by Sleary, we found how they came to epitomize selfless love. How they came to help Tom in his crisis, which Bizar did not do. And Sissy emerges in the novel as a Christ figure, you know. So now I return to the moot point. I said that it is a dystopian text. And I, I back this argument from a stray comment made by Joseph H. Gardner, though he did not explore this issue in detail, which I meant to do uh, in this lecture in my own way. Uh, Joseph H. Gardner mentions in an article, Dickens's dystopian metacomedy, Hard Times, Morals and Religion. This article was published in a book uh, that was published in 2000. Uh, the name of the book was The Victorian Comic Spirit, New Perspectives. Gardner comments there that Dickens is one of the founding fathers of dystopian fantasy. In what sense dystopian? This in Latin, Greek, topos. Topos, so this topos meaning bad place, opposite of utopia, you already, you know, probably. Coketown is indeed a bad place. Everything is amiss. Everything is, has gone astray there. It is under the burden of a crushing utilitarian machinery. It is a town which is beset with greedy industrialists. And, you know, trade unionists who are hooligans, like Slackbridge. It is, a, it, is a, it is a locale where the education system has, got, has gone astray, has gone to the dogs. An education that relies on facts, 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 and nothing but facts. 
Coketown is a locale where no familial relationships hold water. Yes, there is a utopia within this dystopia. That is the circus domain. The circus projects a bigger circus. If I, if I take the word circus in a derogatory manner that grad grind meant to take, I should say that circus is in the grad grind family. In the main, in the real circus, there is no circus. You know, if I take the meaning of the word circus in its derogatory ramification. So, how do I read Dickens's novel then? How do I read it? The circus world is characterized by lack. What kind of lack? Sissy's father is goosed at times, a number of times. Sleary also has an impediment in speech. Mere meager, you know, grand medicines are not there. Nine oils are procured to heal the wounds, isn't it? But in the circus world, a son does not dupe the mother. In the circus world, there is no Mrs. Pegler who suffers the hypocrisy of her son, Mr. Bounderby. There is a utopia within this dystopia. And of course, Coketown is indeed a bad place. But Dickens means to suggest that along with Darwinian evolution, if you are to talk of values, if you are to talk of feelings, if you are to talk of passions, they can help us only, you know, subscribing to the narrow, utilitarian, mechanized, uh, you know, dictums won't help us in the long run. That's all I had to say, Benazir. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you, sir, for that wonderful lecture. But we have some questions coming up in the chat box. Can I read sure. it to you? Sure, sure, sure. OK. The first one is from Jila Madhikari. Yes. She asks, Victorian Britain continuously faced conflicts between humanity and emotions and developing science and education. Yes. So can this text be a parody of such conflicts? Of course, it is a parody. And you know, it is it is very explicitly parodying those conflicts. Because Dickens, I, I, I told you that he was no Marx. Marx was very much his contemporary. But he did not try to give a Marxist panacea to the problem. He says that, yes, I'm not uh, trying to say that, uh, you know, Marx's principles were not feasible. But what I am trying to say is, uh, Dickens's way was different. Dickens believed in humanity. Dickens believed in evolution. Dickens believed in nurturing and cultivating value systems rather than, you know, blindly succumbing to a system. So if she's talking about parody, Dickens is very consciously parodying uh, those things. Thank you, Venazi. Yes, sir. And there is one more question. Yes. Yeah, it's from Manisha Hussain. She yes. asks, although Charles Dickens is mainly critiquing the utilitarian theory, uh, yes. sir, do you think such a system could be made to work by rectifying its flaws? Of course. Of course. Dickens is not critiquing in that sense. It is not a blind criticism, let me say. Utility is necessary because if, if you do not go by utilities, life would be meaningless. But an utility devoid of humanity is a clear mess. That's what Dickens means to say. I agree with her. Benazir. Yes, so there is one more question. Just a minute. Yes, yes, please, please, please. Yeah. Suraya Sultana has put this question that yes. Hard Times is a dystopian text, but why it is called fantasy? Yeah, because Coketown is an imaginary place. Dickens is not naming things, you know. He's fantastically imagining things. His, set, his setting is fantastic. So that's why. Okay? Yes, of course, it is a realistic novel rooted in the society. 
but uh, Cope Town is an imaginary location. Yes, sir. That's all. Thank you Thank so you. much, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. So this is the end of day one as of now, and tomorrow we have the day two, and the YouTube Meet link will be sent to that WhatsApp group. And thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Venezi. Yes, sir. Thank you.